Mark. How are you? Hi, I'm good, thanks. How are you doing? I'm doing pretty well, you know, the usual. <laughs> <laughs> so, as you know, I'm interviewing you a little bit about your work and who you are. Uh, so I'd like to know a little bit more about your background and what got you started in landscape painting. Sure. Um, well, as you said, I'm uh, by default a landscape painter. Um, I can trace it back um, before college. I went to the Slade School of Fine Art in London, um, graduated in 97. Um, most of my time spent there, the first three years of four, I was an abstract painter. And I found that what I was chasing in the abstract language um, wasn't best served by it. So I did an uh, almost a stylistic U-turn uh, at the beginning of my final year. And all the people around me said, what on earth are you doing? You know, you spend the last three years cultivating, uh, you know, a sort of serviceable abstract language. Um, but I wasn't interested in filling a void. Uh, so there was something in a uh, representation of myself in relation to the world that became far more important. Mm -hmm. Wow. Oh my gosh. So, it's, yeah, it's really interesting how also with, with previous artists that I've interviewed, some of them have really touched on the abstract and then somehow they turn into realism and then they, they kind of marry them in a way. And I feel like that's kind of what I see in your work where you have that expressiveness. You know? Yeah, I, I think that, I mean, unlike some artists, maybe that you're, you're interviewing, I didn't come mm -hmm. from the Atelier school right. um, route. You know, I went very much through the Bachelor of Art uh, university education um, mm -hmm. that was very postmodern. Yeah. Um, maybe not as much as some schools in London at the time, you know, Goldsmiths, for example, but, you know, the idea of installation and um, site specific being mm -hmm. uh, very much a kind of keyword. Um, as a painter, you, you already feel like an anachronism. Mm -hmm. And in some ways you have to work doubly hard. <laughs> <laughs> yes, very true. Um, and then also, since you mentioned, um, you graduated in 1997. So for sure you existed in the art world before social media and then you also experience it in social media so uh, since you experience it firsthand um i wanted to know what is the main difference that you've noticed in the pre-social media art world and the post-social media art world in some ways the it, it's a shrinking of the art world but from very different directions mm -hmm. uh pre-social media um, everything was far more regional in a lot of ways, and by regional I mean sort of country, country-wise. Mm -hmm. I remember, you know, getting to the end of my degree, um, and I had a show in, in Norway, um, mm. and I rapidly realised that nobody there really cared about what was happening in London, for obvious reasons, <laughs> and I had no idea what was happening in Norway. Mm -hmm. uh, so there, there was very much a sense of um, uh, it being a smaller world that, that you had to make the decision to travel within. Um, the interaction with art on the broader scale um, wasn't there so much. I mean, it, mm -hmm. it was, but it, it was magazine based. Um, you know, magazines like Art Forum were uh, were on the the art school racks. You know, mm -hmm. you have to know that somehow. Um, and looking back on it now, I can hardly believe that uh, there was a time when looking up any other gallery in any other part of the world wasn't easy. Right. And in fact, uh, you know, at that point, I wasn't even aware of it. Um, mm -hmm. Weirdly, um, I think the social media influenced world has also shrunk the art world. Um, because if, if one isn't careful, 
you very quickly get shown more and more of what you're already interested in. Mm -hmm. So your uh, the need to stretch out beyond yourself has to be chosen. Yes. You know the the sense of um, almost self editing your desire to look. Um, you know, when, when you go into a bricks and mortar gallery, uh, you might not like what you see, but going in to see it is quite important because then at least you know what you don't like about it. You know, mm -hmm. if you feed yourself a diet of the same type of thing, right. then you're, all, you're always gratified. Yes, yes. You're not growing. You're not expanding yeah. your horizons. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That sense of emotional self-editing becomes really mm -hmm. important. Yeah, yeah. And um, in our last conversation, I remember you mentioning that social media is a double-edged sword. And I feel like since you mentioned it, um, having that effect of, of shrinking, it could be bad and it could be good. Um, mm -hmm. So I wanted to know, you know, like, since it is a double-edged sword for a lot of artists where like it limits your your worldview but then it can also expand it how do you recommend for people to navigate that psychological aspect of growth versus self-gratification i think <laughs> well that, that's a that's a very loaded question isn't it i think that um the art world um it, it isn't just one thing you know, it, it's there are multiple parts of it that all seem to um, to work in tandem or sometimes against each other. Um, and like I said, you know, it's very easy to streamline oneself into a very particular direction. Um, I think at the same time, the the inherent problem with social media is you're looking at imagery on a two inch square. Um, which has a tendency, obviously, to reduce detail, mm -hmm. uh, reduce modulation, um, reduce the what would be termed the technical narrative of the painting, um, and the um, our attention span for for seeing that two inch square image is <laughs> is really shrunk. Um, mm -hmm. And to my way of thinking, I'm not sure that can be a very good idea for looking at a painting, for example. Mm -hmm. Let's face it, we're talking about paintings. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I cannot help but wonder whether that two inch square that we've become so familiar with and so used to becomes a subconscious role model mm. in, the, in the, the, the subsequent creation of paintings. Mm -hmm. You know, are we, making paintings for Instagram. Right. And I think at the back of most people's head, there is going to be a little bit of that because we're so used to seeing it that way. Mm -hmm. um, so again, I think that um, one of the things that I have certainly had to engage is this kind of critical facility of surface. Um, you know, I, I can't help but wonder whether we're going to have more square paintings in the future. <laughs> you know, because the, the, yeah. the lack of cropping and the, and the ease, you know, we are, mm -hmm. we do the path of least resistance. Yeah. So I think a little bit of um, rigor um, in selection and connecting to the history of. Mm -hmm of the the practice you know if yeah. you engage with art history um which it's very easy to do you know you you lose the image or rather you lose the object and you retain the image mm -hmm. and um social media has a uh, has a role to play in that yeah um i think also the one of the the, the problems is the speed of things you know, the more we rattle through images, you know, this the, the kind of endless scrolling, um, the the less time we devote to any individual image. Do we then carry that forward into our own work? Mm. 
interesting. You know? yeah. And so I think almost it's like stepping back, taking a little bit of time. I mean, paintings take time. You know, this mammoth behind me took, you know, six weeks. Um, and that's almost the way it needs to be at times um, in order to engage with the practice, you know, the, right. the, the craft of making. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because also um, we have this duality in, in Instagram where we have painters who barely post anything. And I feel like those are the ones who are probably a bit more authentic in a way, unless of course they're ala prima painters, but because it takes so long finishing a painting, they will only post when it's absolutely ready or maybe even like process images, but it, it's a much longer time span versus we have the other side, which is people posting every day, posting every day, painting every day, which it's good to have the discipline, but the quality might suffer. You well, it's what the team that's doing my rounds at the moment where it's um the top picture is leonardo da vinci holding mm -hmm. up the mona lisa saying amazing i've spent the last 15 years in this painting it's finally finished and the bottom picture is um somebody chewing the nails at a, a computer screen saying my god i haven't posted three days in three days people must think i'm dead <laughs> um you know i think that there, there's the the extreme version but there's the parallel yeah yeah and in a way i feel like a lot of that um is more so a mental thing um we're all so anxious all the time thinking that everyone's watching us when in reality they're, they're probably not um so it's just best to focus on on what we do best which is painting and creating yeah, yeah. and it's also remembering you know that the thing that we all know is that what we're seeing is the edited highlights mm -hmm. uh, of people's lives and in, in this sense people's creative practices you don't see the errors you don't see the um the inherent problems of painting playing themselves out over time because you're you're seeing you're seeing the best bits um i think one of the things that keeps me a little more sane at times um is sharing process and sharing process when it isn't necessarily looking so good mm -hmm. um, because that's how the paintings look for 95 percent of the time <laughs> right they, it can't always be good mm -hmm. you know i don't know which artist it was who said that um you're supposed if you leave a painting unfinished it's still supposed to look good or it's supposed to look good all the way along the way Mm -hmm. uh, I've heard that. I, I think it was Whistler. I could be wrong, but <laughs> you know that that isn't necessarily a practical um, reflection of mm -hmm. most people's practice. But I mean, particularly mine, which is so focused on a kind of creative destruction along the way, mm -hmm. uh, which presumably comes from or isn't unrelated to my abstract roots. Right. Right. And then, since we covered a bit of the negative aspect of social it's media, positive. Wait. <laughs> there is a positive, <laughs> I think, I hope. Um, I mean, in, in any community, like there's, especially with Instagram, you know, we have like the negative side, which is the self-editing, the anxiety, the feeling like you have to, to paint and, and post only these beautiful edited versions of yourself that are probably not even attainable. Like they're just, <clears throat> sorry, excuse me. They're probably just like illusions in a way. Um, and I feel like that can mess with your head. So let's talk about <laughs> the positives that can prevent that from happening. So what would you recommend? Well, I think the obvious thing, the obvious positive is, is the, the connectivity um regardless of the kind of atomized um nature of um the digital digitization of painting um i can't think of a way that i would have ever come across certain artists work um you know without traveling to another country and accidentally coming into contact with it um uh, an artist like nicola samori for example, I think we spoke about last time. He, um, he's an artist I would never have seen 
Um, and he has an incredibly underactive um, social media presence. I'd love to be able to see more of the work, but I, I can see it. Um, so that that's, you know, that, that has an effect, you know, it, it means that the, the influences that I can subconsciously or maybe consciously draw on are, have expanded. Mm -hmm. And that wouldn't happen without social media. Right. Um, and I can't think of a better positive than that. Yeah, that's true. And then aside from that, the, the opportunity aspect of social media, which is mm. you're so connected that people, other people who might never have seen your work come across it and they're like, this is exactly what I've been looking for. Or, oh my God, mm. I can't believe I've never seen this. This is amazing. Um, and I'm guessing this has happened to you with, with your stuff. Um, so <laughs> what opportunities have you come across thanks to social media? Well, it, it's, it's been, it has been very interesting and it's been uh, progressively more interesting as, mm -hmm. as, the, as the years pass. Um, one thing that, that happened very recently is um, when I finished college, um, I, I, you know, had some gallery interest. I came out of a college in London and that's where all the galleries are. So, you know, mm -hmm. there's all kind of meshing of the two. And I came into contact with somebody um, after college. But I think like a lot of people, it took me about a year to figure out how to paint again <laughs> after, <laughs> after school. Um, you know, once I'd take, taken the training wheels. And so I wasn't really in the best of places to, to, to forge that kind of ongoing relationship mm -hmm. uh, until last month, 24 <laughs> years later, oh my gosh. Uh, this, this particular person who, who, who owns a gallery in the UK um, had been on my mailing list for all that time and finally reached out and said, look, I, I really like what you're doing, you know, with the, with the, the new Newfoundland paintings. Um, let's, let's try and do something together finally. Um, so the long and the short of it is that if the London Art Fair is going ahead, what with, um, you know, the new COVID strain, um, mm -hmm. GBS Fine Art in the UK will, will take three of my paintings to London Art Fair with uh, onwards representation from there. Yay. And if, that, you know, if it hadn't been for email mailing lists and, and mm -hmm. sending things out into the world and keeping those contacts, which possibly might not have happened without social media in the digital world, mm -hmm. that, that contact may well have slipped away. Right, yeah. Yeah, and then, um, gosh, and then I'm guessing this page, you know, these, these, this gallery person, he probably checked out your Instagram too and thought, oh my God, look at this, this is amazing. Because mm. in a way, Instagram does work as a portfolio as well. Um, yeah. And I feel like people jump into your website if they're really interested, you know, but mm. that's, it's really awesome. Like, <laughs> it's mm. such a great opportunity. It, it's also, you know, it's portfolio and visual diary, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that that's one of the great things about being able to use it um, less as a, these are my best bits, to this is what the life of it is like. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there, there is an, an, I think, you know, we are, I mean, as painters, we are, we're horribly solitary, you know, and we, we naturally and necessarily shut ourselves away to do the thing that we need to do yeah um, and having a tool through which to connect with you know a larger community of both artists and non-artists and say look this is this is what it's like this is what i'm trying to enlighten myself with mm -hmm. uh, has a kind of comfort yeah you know yeah I, I, comfort might be the wrong word but it's certainly a, a camaraderie mm -hmm. it is yeah because you're it's almost like a diary in a way where you're but it's focused on on your work so you're focusing on oh today wasn't such an easy day or mm. 
this is the product of hours of self-reflection and understanding myself and understanding what I'm doing. So I'm it does make it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's a very vulnerable thing and it, it can be very vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And I think that's also why people self edit so much. It's almost like they're trying to like protect themselves from, from being so exposed when in which reality, is, yeah, <laughs> continue. Which, which analogy to um, somebody filtering their selfie. Right. Right. Because you know. they they put up these defenses instead of hmm. realizing that, you know, painting and, you know, showing the process and understanding that it's difficult, but then working through that and having that self-knowledge, um, it inspires other people, you know, because they realize, oh my God, I'm not the only one that's struggling. Even this person who's been painting for 20 more years than me, they're struggling. And mm. it's it's an uphill kind of battle, but you always win a little bit, you know, like step by step. <laughs> it's, I think it's inherent struggle. Um, and the the action of painting day by day is akin to wanting to fail better each day yes you know because it is built upon failure you know the i think one of the the great truisms of, of painting and um, particularly painting representationally is that you're attempting to construct a version of reality from a series of absolute abstractions mm -hmm um you know we're we're moving paint around and attempting to make it into a world yeah. uh and but i think as picasso said you know paintings are lies through which the truth is revealed um and i think there's a bit of that in in everything we do mm -hmm. no matter how you attempt to cover it up yeah uh, yeah yeah and and it is true you do um i think i've heard I don't know who said the phrase, but you fail up. <laughs> like yeah. you don't fail down, you fail up. Like with your failures, that means your next painting is going to be better because we don't really learn from things that go well. You know? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, you, you, because you, if, if, if something is a success, you want to repeat it because it feels better. Yes, yes. And it's obviously it's okay to, to do well. <laughs> We're not saying yeah. suffer and do like the <laughs> worst. No, it's. It's do well, but understand that, mm -hmm. you know, if you fail, it's not a bad thing. You know, you're always growing. Yeah. yeah. Well, you have to return to kind of bloody mindedness yeah. about it. <laughs> you know, that it's um, a stubborn diligence that says that keeps calling you back to the easel. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It pulls you back always. And that, that's the history. You know, yeah. it, it, the responsibility of it's like you know you start this process and you realize you have a responsibility to painting mm -hmm. you know, i'm going to put this thing out in the world with my name on it at least on the back of it um and and say this is the best i can do you know the best i can do with these materials that raphael did far better with mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> and try and get better yeah mm. yeah wow it's, it's a long <laughs> yeah. and beautiful, difficult path. <laughs> oh, man. Um, and then speaking, of course, of your paintings, um, which paintings are going to be in the, well, if COVID allows, uh, are going to be at the London Art Fair? Right. There's a painting called Accumulation, um, mm -hmm. which uh, the reason that I, that I first arrived in, in Newfoundland was for a residency. And mm -hmm. it was the thing that got me here and compelled me to stay in some ways. Um, and that painting is based on a road that led away from the residency. Um, mm. Pooch Cove, where, where the residency is, was, is such, um, it has an it just, it's extraordinary landscape. And the, the dominant feature is the coastline and the, this, this very, very strong sea that's permanently kind of pushing at you like a, a personality mm. when I first arrived the only way to handle it was effectively to turn in the opposite direction <laughs> and, and look at the land um, mm -hmm. and that painting was a, a direct reaction to that um, another painting is called soft gray ghosts which is turns 
you in the opposite direction and it is not unlike this one behind me it, it is very much sea it's sea and coastline um but attempting to find time moving within a still image uh, and or compelling that compelling the, the viewer to to experience some kind of time and the third one is um, a little one it's only 16 by 24 inches and it's called we tread lightly mm -hmm. um and that oh, actually we move lightly sorry um and <laughs> that is a little uncharacteristic for me um it was the first painting that i I started really pushing the chroma up in some of the colors um, and it, it, it's uh, it's an island um, mm -hmm. in a, a, a relatively calm sea and it's yeah it, as painting it, it had a, a big effect on me and seems to seems to attract the eye of others um, mm -hmm. and I think it's also concerned with this this sense of our time looking at something is very fleeting but memory reshapes the experience yet we carry we keep carrying it forward and that yet the place remains um yeah, yeah that those are the three paintings that are, that are going to go um and yeah i sincerely hope that they get there you know i i grew up into the london art world i showed mm -hmm. at the london art uh, um, numerous times as I developed as a as a painter mm -hmm. and to to show there again after 10-15 years will be a wonderful thing yeah yeah especially after this strange pandemic era where everything just feels so stalled and, and so held back in a way yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah. I think you know, the possibility for people of seeing work again you know yeah. standing in front of paintings i mean particularly for me that aren't my own <laughs> <laughs> you know somebody else's brush strokes will be lovely that is very true i didn't think about that <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh yeah yeah you know i miss that too <laughs> mm. <laughs> hopefully i can go to london and see it but when actually when is the london art fair supposed to happen it starts mid-january um oh. i think it's this is it, 17th to the 21st something like that mm -hmm. cool yeah i'm not gonna make it but <laughs> i'll go in <laughs> <That> spirit <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um but yeah no that's it's beautiful how like you mentioned how that third piece is is very different from the others and and you're experimenting even still after so much time mm. of of painting and and working with these landscapes you know it, do you feel like maybe the place that you're in now influenced that shift or is it like where think, did the experimentation come from <laughs> i think in some ways yes the um the the residency experience and then the um the onwards experience of painting in a new place um allowed me to catch up with myself you know catch mm -hmm. up with something that i've been chasing maybe um for many years and it was it was always sort of trickling through my fingers somehow mm. and there were two parts of that one was the the relaxing of a a very distinct linear perspective into a painting mm -hmm. uh, one of the problems i had one of one of the reasons i had a problem with painting the sea um was the lack of a way into the painting and the lack of uh, enough matter in the thing to hold you in there. Yeah. Um, there was no invitation. It was almost like, you know, you're, you're held to stand still in front of a horizon. And I didn't really want that. Hmm. Um, but the other thing was the increased palette. Um, you know, I arrived in Newfoundland a little over two years ago. Um, having spent you know some considerable years making not entirely monochromatic paintings but the to say that the 
palette was reduced um, mm -hmm. would be an understatement in the extreme. Um, <laughs> now that I have, you know, my, my working table has an, an array that's almost unhealthy, you know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I got to the point where oh, no, that could be interesting. Um, so I'll I'll keep it available. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying everything gets squeezed out on the palette every time. You know, I don't start a painting in that way. But um, dealing with memory became about pushing the color cast of things just as it as much as it was about the place right. uh, and I feel like I'm I've arrived slow at the slow to the party um, <laughs> on this one you know it's like yeah that's, that's kind of an obvious thing to say um, <laughs> but it, it took a little bit of you know knocking my head against the painted wall to to figure that one out and having the time to pause you know to make mistakes to to, to, to spend two months at a residency and not produce anything, even though I did, you know, at least the option was there, um, had, had a big effect. Um, so, yeah, that, that was the thing that really, you know, pushed it. But also, you know, I think part of the process of painting is that the whole thing is unknowable. You know, we're chasing this enigma um, that we've been trying to chase for the last 45,000 years, um, you know, moving pigment around and attempting to turn it into something that we, we can understand the world by and understand ourselves by, more to the point, mm -hmm. beyond the idea of communicating anything. Mm -hmm. uh, and if there isn't a better way to keep hungry, for it, um, I can't think of anyone. I think also the the, the it's not like a postmodern idea of converting imagery into words. You know the the the, the idea or the, the concept behind something in a textual way um, became yeah. I was about to say almost became more important, but actually became more important than mm -hmm. than, than the image um, turning painting painting in definitely into an anachronism, mm -hmm. uh, and it isn't. Right. You know, it, it, it isn't. You know, we're talking about the death of painting since the nineteen twenties, <laughs> and we're still talking about years. yeah, and people are yeah. still painting. You know, yeah. and it's, I don't think it's ever been more vital. Yeah. Yeah. And I feel like, like you said, like reducing a painting into words, especially since I feel like words, since they are a construct to try to represent something in a simple way, it already removes so much of the meaning that I feel like it's almost like language isn't a gross oversimplification of an image. <laughs> yeah, I, I think um, painting is is non-verbal, you know, it's non-verbal visual communication. Mm -hmm. If we want to tell a very specific didactic story, there are better mediums for that. You know, yeah. cinema, a novel, um, poetry, mm -hmm. they're art forms that are already working within the, the constructs of language. Right. This is something else, you know, this is a, a different world. Um, you know, I think that this idea of the painted world um, has become very valuable to me. Um, creating um, a, I want to say a window. I mean, it's corny, but you know, outside the within the bounds of the the edges, mm -hmm. there's something that's an invitation. You know, we're being invited into something, and that is a world of pain that mm -hmm. is almost alchemical yeah. you know it, it's pretending to be an illusion and yet you cannot get past the fact that it's a substance you know it's a thing in and of itself mm -hmm. um, and i think that 
that start that that idea occupies me more and more as time goes by and painting gets harder <laughs> it, it just gets harder you're like the third person to tell me that um <laughs> like i keep hearing this from people who've been painting forever um mm -hmm. and they're like i asked them does it does it get easier and everyone says the same thing no <laughs> no <laughs> no it Darn doesn't it. but it gets, it gets better ah I think you know, that's the improvement. Because um, you, you start to know the extent of your own ignorance and you realize what else is there. Um, and the incredible possibility within paint and painting. You know, you've only got to stand in front of, oh, the obvious one that comes to mind is a, is a Caravaggio um, mm -hmm. and see what, or Jan van Eyck and, and see what painting or oil paint is capable of um, 500 years ago. <laughs> you know, um, what can we do with it now? You know, what, what else can we learn? Um, yeah. You know. wow. pushing, pushing it to its limits and beyond. <laughs> well, yeah. Um, you know, looking at um, an Anselm Kiefer painting, mm -hmm. for example, um, which is absolutely to do with, with the, the alchemy of history um, and what paint is able to do, not in a um, in such an illusionistic way, but certainly attempting to render images that enable us access to something else. You know, is this mm -hmm. it's something else? yeah it's it's very you make it sound very esoteric <laughs> <laughs> yeah maybe <laughs> it can be I, I feel like it can be since mm. I mean, esotericism and, and the occult implies like something that's hidden and you're trying to uncover you know yeah yeah i think i think yeah hello dear yeah i think <laughs> that there is a there's a great deal of um truth in that you know, it, it's both incredibly down to earth because it is pigment and oil. Mm -hmm. you know, it's about as primal as it gets. You know, it is literally the cave floor, you know, yes. moved to the cave wall. Um, but that's where the alchemy began. Mm -hmm. You know, trying to understand, I'm saying again, trying to understand what the hell we are. <laughs> and not necessarily what we're doing here because that's rather unanswerable but mm -hmm. certainly what am i in relation to the rest of the world yeah that's beautiful <laughs> mm. yeah yeah oh. <laughs> this, it just keeps it but it keeps you going with it yes it does it keeps mm. you going um and what's funny is i was actually going to ask you if you have any words of wisdom that you live by <laughs> Um, so, I mean, I feel like that's one, but do you have any, any other words of wisdom that you want to share with everyone? Um, I think the, 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 the biggest thing is show up, mm. you know, th this is, um, I think as a painter, I can't speak to the other arts, but as a painter, you, you will always have the smile of a person who knows their life work will never be done. Mm -hmm. uh, that and it's a healthy obsession yes <laughs> it, it, it not necessarily always but it, it's something that fashions in art come and go you know if you're trying to paint for an audience or a perceived audience by the time you finish the painting, you're always going. You're already going to be behind them, yeah. Playing catch up, so you have to. I'm mixing this all a little around, but um, don't make a compromise with commerce. You know, um, it's not about a short term um, success. It's about a long term journey mm -hmm. through painting um 
so yeah it's almost like if, if you and if you sort of re-engineer your idea of what success is you know mm -hmm. um frank Auerbach said painting isn't a game of success and i think there's a great deal of, of truth in that um the success is that you're able to keep doing it and i think mm -hmm. remembering that at the core of things rather than getting swept up in the next gallery the next book the next exhibition or whatever it might be mm -hmm. um, it's still you and the painting in a studio and that's where the success lies yes yes very well said mm, thank you <laughs> you're welcome well um this was a really wonderful chat um i learned a lot i hope everyone also learned a lot too so thank, thank you, you so much mark this was great <laughs> thanks, um, hopefully thanks. Of course. Yeah, of course. And then hopefully in the future, uh, maybe we can have you on the podcast and we can have like a much longer philosophical conversation. <laughs> about... I, I do get the feeling this is the beginning. <laughs> yes, this is, I feel like this is just like a little taste of what we might talk about. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you so much. Um, and then everyone, if you want to check out Mark's work, please go to his Instagram, his website, and then stay tuned because maybe the pandemic will, you know, not be so bad and the london art fair will happen so go check out his pieces at the london art fair that'll be good <laughs>